Uh, thank you. Um, I want to thank Dr. Cleveland and the ICAS staff and Temple University for actually having me here. Um, in addition, I'd like to thank the Yokosuka Council on Asian Pacific Studies, which is YCAP, um, for their ongoing efforts to foster dialogue. So I'm going to go ahead and begin. Today I'm going to be touching on a couple of subjects um, that I feel that are um, going to be really important with the upcoming Olympics. Uh, first, I'd like to touch on information security in the Olympics as a whole. Um, additionally, I will touch on the home user. So this will not be a very high, high-end technical um, conference. What I like to try to do is I like to try to teach as I'm fostering dialogue with you. Because there's a lot of things that go up, actually occur that we don't even realize that we're doing. So with that being said, um, when I end, I always end on academics. For me, that is a, a big thing that is missing. Um, so you will hear me talk about academics towards the end. Um, so now we'll kind of begin. The first thing I would like to say is um, thank you guys for coming out um, for this event. Next, I would like to say I do have one rule, and you're going to hear this if you ask me this question. If you ask me about my political opinion, I will tell you I support the President of the United States and the American people. That is my opinion. I work for the U.S. government. So please respect that. All right, off we go. My background information. Um, I was born and raised in Huntsville, Texas. So Huntsville, Texas is a town of about 25,000 people. It is known for two things. Sam Houston State University, which is one of the best criminal justice universities in the world. There's a reason for that. I was born and raised around seven prisons. <laughs> Within those seven prisons is death row. Um, I will get into death row here in a minute, and I'm going to teach you something that has to do with computing in prison. So um, after kind of joining the prison system and actually working on death row for four years, um, I was in the U.S. Navy for another four years. Um, I was able to actually get enough money to go to college. So I graduated from the University of Maryland, University College. And after that, I finished my master's in cybersecurity at Capital College in uh, Maryland. Now, since I mentioned prison, um, The location that I worked at was it called LS1 Unit. Um, it's no longer there anymore because they moved death row. But I was a sergeant there, so let me do a little bit of correlation. The correlation is how did a guy get from death row to cybersecurity director? Well, let me tell you how. Think about a prison, the outside of the prison. That is your, basically, that's inside your network. So I would come down and I would yell out, chow time to everybody involved. That means it's time to eat. So I had cell block one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Everybody knew it was chow time. That information went out to everyone. Correlation, what is that? That is a hub. What does a hub do? A hub, once you send something out to one person, it goes out to absolutely everybody. That's what I'm doing. I'm coming down, I'm yelling, chow time. Everybody knows. So if you send a message on a hub from, I don't know, Kim to Stacy and Jim and Jack are on the other end, everybody's going to get that same message. So. Um, that's how I kind of correlate hubs with the prisons. 
Now we're still within that wall. Switches. I would go over and I would say, block number one, I want you guys to get ready to take a shower. And then I would tell the sergeant, I need you to go tell block number two, they're going to be next. That's what switches do. Switches basically are smart devices. You tell them what to do. They basically take the MAC address and they move that data to certain people. So, what are you doing? It's still within the network. It's not, a, it's not outside the network. So, now you've got a switch and you've got a hub. 99.9% .9 of the people in here have what I'm going to say next, which is a router. The router. I am the router. So what would I do? When we got ready to transport someone on death row, I would actually set up the location, the routes, and so forth, which means I had to go outside the prison to talk to the Texas Rangers, to the Huntsville Police Department, to the Highway Patrol. So that means I'm going outside. So when you do your router, you have to think of it as you're going outside the prison to a destination point. That means you need to have an IP address. You just can't take it out the box and plug it in. Most people do that and they're like, it's not working. The same with me as working in a prison. Hey, I don't know where I'm going. That's what a router does. So that's how I kind of correlate prison with IT systems. And you will hear me do this a lot. Because to me, when you talk about information technology, you have to make it where everyone understands what you're talking about. So even if I'm talking to an engineer, a professor, I will use what you are really good at and make it simple. That's what we do in IT, or else it becomes really complicated. So I'm going to move on. Um, when you think of cybersecurity, three things you need to know. CIA. No, I'm not talking about the Central Intelligence Agency. I've worked there and been, done, I've been there and done that. I'm talking about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. What does that mean? Well, confidentiality is something you have and something you know. For example, if you work at Temple University, you have a, a badge, you plug it into the cat cord, that is something you have. Something you know is going to be the PIN number. That is confidentiality. What happens with confidentiality, what can break it, password cracking, and dumpster diving are the main two. Integrity, that means that information that you're sending is from point A to point B without the data being changed. The most common attack that occurs with integrity is the man in the middle. And you're going to wonder, what's the man in the middle? So I'm going to go back to what I know best, history. 1869, not 1869, excuse me, 1569, Mary Queen of Scott is in prison. Her supporters decide that, hey, we want to assassinate Queen Elizabeth I. The supporters send her a letter stating that. She sends the letter out. It is intercepted. They change the letter and make the letter state that we need the name of all the conspirators. And they're thinking that it's coming from Mary Queen of Scots, and it's not. The supporters respond to it with all the information of the conspirators. That is a man in the middle attack. Needless to say, Mary Queen of Scots was killed, and so were her supporters. That is a man in the middle attack. Think about that. 
1569 this occurred, and it's still going on today. Availability is exactly what it sounds like. I have the availability to get on the web, and my web page is actually working. What stops it? Denial of service attacks. What that means is I'm going to flood you with so, much, so many packets that your website will not run. It won't operate. It's going to go down because I'm just throwing packets at you. What's the best way for me to do that? Bots. How do I get bots? I send something to you and I say, hey, you want to win a million dollars. You click it, now your computer is my computer. And I do that to a thousand people, now I have a supercomputer. This is what a lot of people do. So when you see your um, computer slow down, a lot of times you don't even realize it. It's not your computer, it is somebody using the information off your computer. They're actually using your packets to send somewhere else. So that's availability. Now, let's go into the reason that we're all kind of here, or the Tokyo, Tokyo Olympic threats. Can anyone in here just please do not be afraid to, to talk? You will see me really, really loosen up and make this really fun. But can anyone in here tell me what country has the best cybersecurity um, program in the world? China. No. Very close. Good answer. Good answer. Anybody else? Yes. Estonia. Estonia? Very good. They're in the top five. Israel. Israel. Absolutely. Why? Israel takes at least 1,000 hits every 60 minutes. I'm sorry, 60 seconds. <laughs> it's 60 seconds, not minutes. So if you think about that, that's incredible for them to be able to thwart that amount of information and not actually be um, compromised. That's incredible. So when we talk about the Tokyo Olympics, do you think Israel is going to be involved? No? Yes, they will. They've already been contracted out because they're the best at what they do, hands down. The second country would be, which surprises me sometimes, Finland. Why? Good software engineers, but where are most of the computers kept? Sweden, Finland, and they have a great research and development team. Because the third one is Sweden. Why? They get the information, they get a virus, they're able to send it through their research and development team to figure out what's going on. And you would think the U.S. would be there. Yes, we are. But we're not at that level yet because we do take a lot of hits. So back to the Tokyo Olympic Games. Threats. The first main threat that the 2020 Tokyo Olympics is going to see, the main threat is going to be foreign intelligence services. You're going to have a lot of countries here. If you don't think they're here to gather information, you're wrong. Because that's what they do. If I'm coming over here and I'm from Russia, China, North Korea, I'm here to gather information. They are the main threat at the Olympics. The second threat is going to be cyber terrorists along with um, cyber criminals. But cyber terrorists are more dangerous because their job, if you take the cyber out of there, 
They're just terrorists. So their job is to cause havoc. I'm going to cut off all your power. I'm here to cause terror. So the fourth one is going to be hacktivist. Somebody's got an agenda somewhere. Doesn't matter where you go. I've got a social agenda. I have a political agenda. And I want to get that across. How do I get that across? I hack and I put something on the Olympic screen. No more fur. It doesn't matter what it is. But hacktivist is the, what we consider the fourth most um, threat vendor at the Olympics. The fifth one is insider threat. Now, as crazy as this sounds, working for the government, the one thing that I always tell everyone is the biggest threat is not you on the outside. It is my users. Users are your main threat and will always be. Why? They're in the network. Sometimes they give out information and they don't even realize it. Does anybody in here know where the, I, I was just kind of curious, where was the computer room at in, at Temple University? Does anyone know? I see some heads shaking, yes, no, maybe. No one knows? Fifth floor? In this building? Oh, really? That's, oh, that's a computer lab? Is that where the main building is? I mean, is that? Stop. I, I, I just want everybody to stop. What was I just doing right now? Don't you dare answer. <laughs> don't, don't, you two don't count. What was I doing? There you go. Social engineering. That is exactly what I was doing to you. And you know better because you used to work under me. <laughs> You're a student. Glad to see you here. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much. But I was probing for information. So when we say insider threat at the Tokyo Olympics, I will come up and I will ask you just general questions. Hey, how are you doing? Start a conversation with you. I will see you again. You'll be like, oh, I, this guy, I saw him again. I'm probing for information. Why do I need to hack someone when I can just ask the question? We're all humans in here. What do we want to do? We want to help other people. That's in our nature. So therefore, you have to be aware. And I can guarantee you right now that there are personnel in this country that are already, they already know who's doing what. This guy's the main guy for this. This guy's the main guy for the network. And they're already probing. So if I really want to get some information, I could. The best person that I know that did this was Kevin Mickney. He was one of the best at social engineering. He can get into a CEO, CEO's office and say, I am here to change out the hard drive. And they would let him in because of his charm. If you have the charm and the personality, people will let you into almost anywhere. They will give you almost any information you want. Also, if you think about it, so, I mean, if I want a social engineer, all I need to do is go to your Facebook, Twitter. You're giving me more information at these locations than I know what to do with. Because you tell me what you're doing, where you're going, you tell me where you work, because you want everyone to know your status. Again, it's a human trait. But sometimes it depends on where you work. You want to know what information you're giving out. If you're working for the Tokyo Olympic Games, you don't want, you don't want to state that, hey, I'm the person that's in charge of all the networks. I'm the person that's in charge of all the power plants. You put that information out, I'm coming for you. That is my job. That is their job. So that's what insider threats are. 
The last but not least, unfortunately, we always have this, ticket scalpers. Um, being that this Olympic Games will be the most um, information technology driven game ever, everything is going to be scanned, everything is going to be, it won't be like the old days where you take the ticket, choop, nope, everything will be beep, beep. So if I'm a ticket scalper, all I do is make that ticket look the same, and I move on. Before you know it, you've lost thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So that's going to occur. It's not if, when, it's just going to occur. Because that's what criminals do. Now, I want to talk about um, some other things here. So, in my opinion, we need to go for from lessons learned. What are some of the lessons that we have learned? Well, I know in, for example, 2016, um, in Rio de Janeiro, that information was put out about the governor, the mayor, and people were wondering, where did this come from? It came from hackers. These guys were hacking everything because they, weren't, they were not prepared. So it, it's one of those things of South Korea last year when they had their Olympic Games. Toward the end, the lights went out. Nobody really realized it, but their power grid was compromised. They completely got into the power grid and they completely turned out all the lights. So those are the lessons that I think this Olympic Committee has already learned. Because you always look back and say, what occurred? How can we thwart it? Because I can tell you right now, hackers, penetration, testers, whatever you do, whatever you name it, they're already setting everything up. Because I would. Because I was a hacker. So. For use it, uh, as I kind of mentioned before, this is the first truly digital interconnected Olympic Games. What does that mean? That means everything from sporting equipment to power supply. Everything is going to be centrally connected. Centrally connected. That kind of scares me, just a little bit. Because when you centrally connect everything, instead of me having in, to get into 15 locations, all I have to do is get into one. Because that's where all your information is. That's where your cameras are. That is where your firewall is. That's where everything you have going on is located. So what would I do first? First thing I would do, I'm sorry, I'm going to blind you. I'm going to turn off your power. If I turn off your power, you don't know what's going on. Turning off power causes panic, causes havoc. If there's a war that breaks out, you won't see missiles flying first. The first thing you're going to see is havoc, SCADA systems, power grids, lights turning, going on and off. You have no idea of what's going on because that's what I want to do. I want you to panic. That is exactly what they're looking for also. They want panic. So now you got to ask yourself, well, if they're doing all this, what are the consequences? Well, my biggest thing is if you're going to use basically electronics for everything, the integrity of the game may actually be compromised. You have to think about that. I mean, everything is connected. So now instead of I, I ran a 10-1, I'm running a 9-1. Because I went inside and I changed it. I hacked, in, I hacked it and I'm good to go. So there's a lot of things that go on. I mean, you're, you're talking about lo loss of life. How can you lose life? Well, if I cut the power supply, People start looking for things, and I turn it back on. Somebody may get electrocuted. 
There's so many things that I can do to make you panic because that is my job again. So I, I continue to, to move forward with this as quickly as I can. The geopolitical situation, um, state sponsored in organized crime, in my opinion, is huge. The states that I think that are gonna be involved are the states that don't like Japan. So you're looking at North Korea, maybe China, there's no maybe in China. China will be here state sponsored. So these guys are really good at what they do. They may be in China, they may be in North Korea, but I guarantee you they're gonna be involved. I can also see Russia. Anybody that you can think of who wants to gain an advantage is gonna be probing. Why do you probe? The reason that you probe is you gather information. I want to know what you're doing that's new that I don't know about. I mean, you think about it. Eric Snowden, NSA, gave away millions of secrets. He doesn't understand how far he put the United States back because we had software and devices that no one knew about. Now the whole world knows about it. That's what the state sponsors, that's what they're probing for. That's what they're looking for devices that they don't know about. Now, let's go ahead and address this big elephant in the room that I like to call the Japan, Japanese minister in charge of cybersecurity. <sighs> um, Mr. Sakurada, um, this is a gentleman who did not could not tell if it was okay to put USBs into nuclear power programs. And I'm like, what? That was my first thought was, what? You never put a USB into anything because I could put a virus. And we're talking about nuclear power plants. If you can't answer that question, how are you gonna run the games? Now, I wanna let you guys know this is my personal opinion of him um, being in charge. Because think about it. Would you let a, a person build your house who has maybe built a house, maybe not? It was 20 years ago, I don't know. Now he's the foreman. Are you going to let him build your house? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't trust him to build your house. He says that he manages people, but let's say 10 people all of a sudden just kind of leave. What happens? He's got to step in. He has to make decisions. How can you make decisions when you don't understand what's going on? If you don't understand, can you give me a decision about what I'm supposed to do when we get attacked? Are you going to depend on a different country? No, you should never do that. It is up to you to make that decision. So my opinion of this whole situation is you got to get someone that's been there and done that. Or else you're going to have a problem. But I'm hoping that doesn't occur. But for me, I'm sorry. I'm a cybersecurity director. I've worked in every facet of the field. There's no way that I can answer questions if I didn't know what I was doing. Should be the same for him. He's the Olympic Committee. He's running all the cyber. So we can discuss that. I'm pretty sure people are going to have questions on that one. So um, as we move along, ITOT um, does, I'm just out of curiosity. I work for NAFAC Far East, which is Naval Facility Engineer. I work on OT operations a lot. OT stands for Operational Technology, which is basically facility-related controls. What does that mean? Facility-related controls. Could mean a lot more that you need. Yeah, I know you know, because I taught you this. <laughs> um, but it could be just a lot 
automatic lock that allows you to get into a door. It needs to be secured. Again, power grids, power dams, nuclear um, plants, those are facility-related controls. We have a tendency of thinking cybersecurity in computers, cell phones. No. That's not what I'm after. I'm after the big things now. That's what they're after at the Olympics, the, the big things. Computers, uh, I'm not worried about that. But I do want your SCADA system. I do want your power. So I just want to let you know the difference, because you're going to hear IT, OT. Because as we know right now, um, Japan is driving around, and they are actually inspecting 200 million IOT, which is the Internet of Things. Internet of Things is, you tell your refrigerator open, it opens. Wi-Fi in your car. Some of the basic necessities. It's good to have technology, but if you're not securing it, what good is it? At the Olympics, they plan on having 5G. How secure is 5G? I've already did a man in the middle attack on it. So that means it's not secure, but they're going to have it at the Tokyo Olympic Games. So you have to think security first. So in everything that we do in the government, anything that we're implementing now, we think security first. You have to. It is a must. Now, when I think of, of Japan, you know, I read a lot. 34% of the executives do not believe that cybersecurity is a threat at all. 34%. They say, oh, we're not worried about it. It'll never happen to us. Next thing you know, ransomware. What is ransomware? And I'll jump into some of this before. Go ahead. Ransomware is a basically computer application that locks your computer down and prevents you from doing anything until you enter an encryption key. Once you enter an encryption key, you can kind of go on about your day. Exactly. So what am I doing? I'm holding you ransom. I'm holding your data ransom. The biggest um, data ransom has been $100 million just to get their site back on, just to get their data back. So you got these people coming into this country, and they're sitting there, they're probing. They're like, I can ransomware some of the locations that are here and make money. It's not that hard. So that's why in the government we start from the bottom up. As we're building things, security has to be involved. That needs to be go across the board. I don't care where you're at, whether it's Japan, Thailand, Philippines, I don't care. You have to build, you have to put security in everything that you're doing that's electronic. And that is exactly what they're doing for this Olympics. Now, you're asking, how do you defend all this stuff? That's, that's just a lot of stuff. The first thing you need to do is you need to plan early. And I will say this, from talking to some personnel, Japan has really, really did a great job of planning. They plan early, very, very early. Um, in 2014, they ran six simulations. This year, they've already ran 14 cyber attack simulations. And this is, this is only April, and they've already ran 14. So they figured out that we've got to increase security. The second one is how do you actually defend? You go by lessons learned. So you look at what happened in the past, what could happen in the future. You always look at the lessons learned. If you don't learn from the past, then you're going to be doomed in the future. Plain and simple. The third one is defense in depth. This is something that we use a lot in the military. Defense in depth is 
prevent, detect, respond. That is what we use. So think of your house. Your house. You want to prevent someone, right? So what do you do? I don't know. I may stick a sign out there that says ADT security to prevent you from actually coming to my house. So how do I detect? If you try to open up my doors or window, the alarm goes off. Respond. I'm from the state of Texas, unfortunately. My response may be a little bit different than yours. <laughs> I'm not going to say how. My response is going to be different. But you respond. If a burglar breaks into your house, that's what the respond is. So that's defense in depth. You try to put as many layers of defense as possible to make it hard to actually get into your network. The thing you guys have to remember is no matter how much equipment that you put into an IT system, OT system, if someone wants to hack it, it will be hacked. There is no magical pill for it. That's just the way that it is. But you can make it very, 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 very difficult for them. So when I say that, one of the things that absolutely drives me insane are passwords. Password, one, two, three, four. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Or you just go across the keyboard. I already know everything that you do. So you're asking yourself, I have 17 memorized passwords that are at least 16 characters. How do I do that? It's not because I'm smart. I'm not that smart. Sam, Allie, you do not get to answer this question. So, <laughs> how do you remember it? I'm going to tell you the easiest way, and I want you to educate anybody that you run into on how to set up a password. Think about this. I don't have a board. Normally, I turn around and I draw it on the board. Take the first letter out of a song that you know. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. You've already got 11 characters. I will throw a number in between on the break sometimes. I will add a character. <coughs> but if you start singing songs, sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tides roll away, I take the first letter out. I make one of them a capital. You'll never go wrong with that unless you're Allie. Somehow she forgot her song. <laughs> she forgot her song, and to this day, I haven't figured that out. <laughs> Favorite songs. So use songs. If you don't know songs, remember poems. Something that sticks with you, something you'll never forget, and just take the first letter out. You'll never forget it, I promise. And your password becomes secure. Instead of writing admin password. Because I'm going to run a dictionary attack, which means I'm going to use every word in a dictionary to crack your password. And that's pretty simple for me to do. So please pass that on. I think that is the easiest way to remember any password that you have. So I'll go into type of text. So, since we're talking about home users, which is something I like to educate people on. <laughs> Microsoft. If you log on to Microsoft, you get there, you hear that ding ding as you're logging on, and you start working, that is incorrect. If you're working on Microsoft, you need to have two accounts. The reason being is when you log in, you're logging in as the administrator, which gives me complete access to change your registry as I see fit. But if you log in as a guest, I can't make any changes to your registry or anything. So you should have two accounts. And I've heard this from people where they say, well, that's too much trouble if I want to change something. 
if I want to make a change, I want to stop using this video and I want to start using uh, this video player. I've got to log out, log back in, and then you know log out. Well, I tell you what, it's easier for me just to say, oh, okay, I've cracked this password. Now I'm in as an admin. But if you had that second one up, there's nothing I could do. So please take that into account and use that. Again, just here to educate on what I already know because I've been there. The second one is, <laughs> I actually did a thesis paper on this, is when you get your router straight out the box, Cisco, there is a default password. I just did this and I was just going around with something called Flying Squirrel, which is gonna give me information on what your Wi-Fi is doing. And I'm looking at the passwords and I go, all these are straight out the box passwords. All I need to do is just find out what kind of device that you're using. I don't need to come in your home. Flying Squirrel or Nmap is gonna tell me what you're using. So if you're using a Cisco device, and let's say it's a 3780, I go on the internet and I type in Cisco 3780. It's gonna give me the default password. I go back, I type it in, now I'm into your router. Which means now I'm into your network. So when you guys think of your computers at home, this is what I want you to use. Think of a castle. Just, just seriously, think of a castle. Um, in your castle, you have your guards up top. In your castle, you also have moat, and you got a fence up. So your castle is basically your firewall. The people that's kind of scrolling up the top, these are your patches and, and antivirus. Now, if you don't update your antivirus or your patches, you're gonna be in trouble. Just like if you don't change those guards out, you're gonna get sleepy. Same thing. So you wanna make it difficult for me to get into your castle. So you've got your moat, which sometimes I will consider as your network router. But if you already let me pass that, I'm walking across the bridge, I'm like, I'm past your moat. Now I just gotta find a way to get past the firewall. Once I get past the firewall, oh, these guards are asleep because you didn't update your patches. Now I'm in your castle. Very simple, simplistic. Make sure you're, I mean, if you have um, Microsoft, put it on automatic update. I know it's a pain sometimes, you're like, ah, oh, my computer's slowing down. I wonder what's going on. I'm what's going on. I probably have control of your system. So, um, the last thing that I do like to touch on is academics. Um, in my opinion, academics are very, very important, especially in this day and time. Um, we know that we have professors in here, and I'm glad that we do have the professors in here because we're falling behind. We're lagging. Did you know in England, between the ages of 5 to 16, you must take coding, programming language? You must. In America, we haven't even started touching on that. Japan has touched on it a little bit, but in America, we're not even close. Places like Israel, Russia, Bulgaria, these places are already doing this. They start at the age of six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It is part of their core. Just like we have mathematics as part of our core, their core has become programming because they know what the future involves. What does the future involve? Computers. 
information technology. That's where everything is headed. I mean, you have to look at the world when I grew up with the big rotary telephones. That's what I grew up with. Now I see kids sitting here doing this, and I'm like, okay, I don't, my son can take my phone and do things with it. I have no idea. So it's a different time, so you have to change with the times. What does that mean? That means we need better education. So sometimes that education will come through universities. I always state that if you can, and you have the money, you have the means, there's always a way. You need to start at the university level. If you don't start at the university level, not everybody's meant to go at the university level. There are certifications out there from A+, plus, Security+, plus, CISSP, CISM. You've got all these things out here. But I'm telling you right now, we are in a crisis when it comes to cybersecurity experts. And there are many reasons that you could want to actually jump into um, this field. Some people jump into it for money. My wife back there can tell you that, hey, when you turn down, oof, let's just say a million dollars over four years, and you're not bothered by it, it's okay because I enjoy what I do and I enjoy working for the government. So you have to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, it's gonna be painful. So always do something that you love. But more than anything, if you're really serious about cybersecurity and you wanna know how to get in, by all means, talk to your professors, talk to your counselors, see what's out there. So, um, with that being said, um, I know we do have like 10 minutes. I probably could talk all day about cybersecurity, and my wife will tell you that. Um, we're going to go ahead and start asking questions. I'm pretty sure everyone has questions that they want to ask. Um, if I can answer them, I will answer them. Um, if I can't give you an answer, I will get back with you. If you give me an email, I'll make sure you get the answer. If it's something that I can't discuss due to the nature of it, I will let you know. I'm sorry, I cannot discuss that. Hey, Mike, nice to see you again. Nice Thanks for coming out here. Nice to see you here. again, sure. Um, I just wanted to know what your perspective was of blockchain technology and how you think that's gonna affect the future. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Blockchain is the future, um, as you kind of know. Uh, that's where everything is kind of headed. Blockchain, quantum computing, um, the thing is, how are we going to hone that in and actually use it? So we're coming up with great ideas, but the problem right now is how are we going to use it? How are we going to secure it? What is the best way to use it? Blockchain is a great one, but from everything I've read and to the people that I talk to, we still haven't found a solution for it. I would say it may be Three to five years, yes. You will hear, start hearing the word blockchain, um, quantum computing, just across the board. Answer your question? All right, thank you. So my question is, um, how do you feel about WRT firmware for open source firmware? And more in general, how do you feel about uh, security of open source software? Great question. Um, Open source, uh, open source software is really great. I mean, if you're talking, you got to think about it. Linux, a lot of the things with open source is command line driven. Not everybody knows how to do command line. I mean, it's one of those double-edged swords is what I say. Because if I'm working in open source, who's to say what I'm giving you of course, they always test it, but who's to say what I'm giving you is not something that's going to negatively affect what you're doing because it's open source. Anybody can put it out there. So I put something out on the board and say, this works. People start clicking it. Next thing you know, 
I'm spoofing them. I've got their information. So open source is always a great tool to use, but I think it needs to be uh, not regulated completely because that would defeat the purpose. But I think there needs to be more security involved with um, you know, some kind of company saying, okay, this is secure, use it. Because Red Hat I, being a full, full major revision behind because they test everything. Yes, Red Hat does. But I've had a run in with Red Hat where there was something that caused a major malfunction on something that I was working on. So that's why I said, by all means, please, um, it needs to be R&D, researched and developed. Do they have that capability at this time? It's open source. So basically, um, it rises and falls on how strong the community is. Exactly. I mean, you have a lot of smart people out there, and some people use it for good, some people use it for bad. I've seen things put up that were, I was like, this is, this is not good. So hopefully we can get a security firm in there to help with the research and development. Hope that answered your question. Thank you for your presentation. Enjoy that very much. Uh, my question is a little bit broad, so please feel free to narrate where you sure. see fit. I'm wondering about what role um, you see machine learning algorithms playing in providing some of the security that you've been describing against those five threats mm -hmm. uh, for the Tokyo Olympics, and if you have any concerns about using machine learning algorithms to provide some of that security. I've, a great, great question, and it's not broad. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely correct. Algorithms are a great source of defense. I mean doesn't matter. I, you want to make it as difficult as possible. Encryptions, algorithms are absolutely, in my opinion, wonderful. Um, will it help with what they're doing at the Tokyo Olympics? 100% yes. Um, I won't go into what the government does, but I can tell you what you just kind of stated is yes. That's where a lot of things are going. Um, I don't want to say too much about algorithms because I'm trying to watch my words very carefully here. But uh, for the Tokyo Olympics, I would hope they would use some of the things that we've already discovered with it, um, that, that being the U.S. government um, and other countries. So to answer your question, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. It was really nice. Thank you. So I wanted to ask about, uh, there's a lot of computer hardware and cell phones and things coming out of China, mm -hmm. especially. And I've heard a lot about hardware hacks. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about that? Uh, like, where's a good place to buy a computer where we could be secure that there's no, like, back doors or malwares? Already on the computer? Uh, um, I, I, this is unclassified information, so I can say this. Um, we don't buy things from China. I, I, I'm just being honest with you. Um, I don't buy anything from China because we discovered as, we, well, we didn't discover, the lab discovered that there was already malware on the computer before it was even open. So we've already did research on it. Um, and we're finding out as we go along that yes, um, the hardware portion of it a lot of it comes out of China. The best location to buy a computer is when you go to the store, ask, any hardware made in China? If they say no, go do your research on that computer. That's what I normally do. I research and research and research until I found out, okay, none of these parts actually came from China. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do, and sometimes it's very tedious. But you don't want your system already compromised before you even open it. Um, and also, if you just happen to travel to China, I can tell you this. If you take any computer component, it's already been scanned as you go through the airport. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's going to hate me. 
Again, thanks for your presentation. So uh, you mentioned one of the things that Japan can do as they prepare for cyber defense for the Olympics is to uh, examine lessons learned. Mm -hmm. Well, two of the most famous hacks in recent memory in Japan involved cryptocurrency, the Mt. Gox hack and the CoinCheck hack, uh, mm -hmm. which millions of uh, Bitcoin and NIM were stolen respectively. So yes. obviously I know that... Uh, FSA has stepped in and increased regulations, and the cryptocurrency exchanges have uh, self-regulated quite a bit here in Japan. So my question is, in that context, do you think Japan has learned lessons learned, at least as it pertains to that, uh, that subgenre of cybersecurity? Now, from what I've read, and Michael Beckel, the gentleman I think was at the last one, we were discussing this, actually. I think that they've learned lessons because, as you said, um, I think they had one in September, and they had one in January that hit them really big. Um, with their new regulations that they're putting out, that is one of the things that they were actually really, really focusing on is the cryptocurrency and how do we prevent this from occurring again. So I think they're learning. Are they 100% there? Both me and Mike were like, I don't know. Maybe it may take another event for them to say, okay, we really, really, really need to take this seriously. Um, because right now, I don't think all the companies are taking it really serious. That, that's the part that scares me, is um, how far are companies going in Japan to secure their devices? I can tell you right now, a company, um, don't want to call them out, but there's a specific company that's very famous who basically told us, we're not worried about security. We don't care, as long as it operates. That's all we care about. So, you can take that how you want to take it, but uh, from lessons learned, you're absolutely correct. They got hit in January, and they got hit in September. Will they learn from it? That's one of those things we'll wait and see, but I wouldn't put all my stock into it right now, because it could be a slow process. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for coming. Oh, no problem. <laughs> I was just wondering about, like, uh, so recently VPNs have started to become more prevalent. Um, mm -hmm. What's your opinion on those, and how do they kind of deter people from hacking your system? Or can they at all? Can they deter? Yeah. I, know. I mean, how do I know if I got, uh, that's a good question, mm. but how do I know if you have VPN? Mm. That becomes a question. Is, I mean, if I, I'm scanning your device, and I see that you have VPN on it. Uh, VPN does not secure, um, it's a secure tunnel. Correct. Mm -hmm. But does it stop me from actually seeing what you're doing? I mean, everything that you read is like, yeah, 100% secure. Incorrect. As I stated before, anything can be hacked. I can sit here and tell you how to hack it, but I don't want anybody to get the, the wrong idea and try to go do it. That's why I won't mention how to penetrate some of these things. Is I've had people that I've mentioned this to before, and the next thing I know, they go out, they get the GUI, they think they know what they're doing, and next thing I know, I get a call, and they're like, hey, you caused me to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so to answer your question, it is I would use VPN, and I, I do use VPN. Because it's better than nothing. It's better than just me jumping on and looking at exactly what you're, where you're going and so forth. Which version of VPN? I use ExpressVPN Woo. currently. <laughs> it is, it is, I, I did my research on it. I, I did my research on all the VPNs. Uh, ExpressVPN is very, very reliable. Um, I'm not looking at the speed. I always look at the security portion of it. They're always doing patches. They're always doing updates. They're always informing me what's going on. And sometimes I test them to see if they're actually doing it. And they are. So ExpressVPN is a good one to use. That's not sponsored, right? <laughs> no, that's not sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> good question. And good question. Thank you. Uh, hi, Michael. Thank you very much for, for educating us today. Uh, I've got a sort of interesting uh, question that I wonder if you thought about. Uh, 
Uh, as we come into this run-up to the uh, 2020 games, there's been a labor shortage across many Japanese industries, including IT. Mm -hmm. There's a big shortage of IT workers. And, and it's a typical cultural problem that you find in Japan is that many of the large companies, banks, everybody else, uh, use uh, contractors. Yes. And I think Snowden was at one point a contractor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of this kind of backdoor that you sort of have this cultural trust of, you, we've been working with this IT company for years and blah, blah, blah. They built it 20 years ago. Yes. And, you know, they're... Down the pyramid, people are trying to hire whatever they can get. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's an old-fashioned wetware, you know, sort of honey trap where some, you know, poorly paid contract worker gets targeted because he has the keys to this Hitachi or something. Yeah. You know, are you guys looking at that and how, 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 you know, it's this kind of odd cultural risk where humans get actually involved um, in, in sort of getting illicit entree to bigger systems because they're contractors who are trusted. Now, are we talking about the Olympics specifically? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could talk about Japan in general, but just let's let's fast okay. forward to the Olympics. So, if, if we're focusing on Olympics, you're absolutely correct. Um, let's start with the shortage. Right now, they are down two hundred and thirty thousand cybersecurity mm. personnel in Japan for this Olympics. Now, they're trying to bring in, as you kind of stated, outside contractors in. But the thing that we're seeing is we're seeing that some of these contractors are not security specialists. They may be network administrators, system administrators, but they're not security specialists. And if you talk with them, it's easy to figure that out. Um, do I believe it? Do I believe and trust what they're doing? No, because how am I going to vet them? How am I going to know that I'm getting what I'm paying for? Unless you go there and sit down and say, okay, I need you to open this up and show me uh, how to open this port. And show me what vulnerabilities. Can you read these logs? So they will try to actually pull from the outside um, world. That's why I think... I mentioned Israel. You're going to see a lot of those people. Um, you're not, and I don't mean it by, by those people. I mean security specialists. Um, they're going to be outstanding because, in my opinion, they know what works, what doesn't work. Um, you will see a couple of other countries involved. That includes the USA. Um, in my opinion, what they should do is take the best. If that means bringing in McAfee, kind of like what they did last year in South Korea, they brought in McAfee. McAfee thwarted, I don't know, over two million pings. Okay. Let me just ask a follow-up question that's often a tangent. Uh, this thing you mentioned about China, uh, most of us understand that uh, Apple Computer makes most of its machines, uh, mm -hmm. iPhones, uh, via Foxconn. And they employ close to a million Chinese laborers to do that. Is is there anything I'm missing? <laughs> I think we're all missing that one because you're absolutely correct. But guess what people are looking for? They're not worried about where it comes from. What are you worried about? Does it work? Oh, look at all these new features. But you have to ask yourself, is it actually secure? There's a reason that I, you know, certain entities in the U.S. don't use Apple. <laughs> there, there's a reason for that. We already know about that one. That's a great question. I have another question that concerns uh, everybody. So uh, with the 2020 Olympics coming, uh, do you believe that the public, so everyone in this room here, could be a potential uh, at risk for an attack, uh, you know, threat? And if so, what are some basic practices that we can adopt to help put ourselves at less risk? Thanks. Yeah, if you're going to the games, um, I will make the recommendations uh, to make sure that, especially if you're taking your phone, because we take our phones everywhere, make sure you have the latest updates, the latest patches. Um, some people will walk around and I look on their phone, and what do I see? Your phone needs to be updated. 
They haven't updated. Always update your phone. Make it automatic where it will update. Some of the other things you can do, if you're not using it, put it in airplane mode. Put it in different modes. Turn it off. Do you really need it? Don't just jump on any Wi-Fi. I could go in there right now and put Olympic 2020 free Wi-Fi. The word free catches everybody. You guys would jump on that so quick because you're like, this is free Wi-Fi. Not knowing that I'm getting every packet that you send down. So be vigilant and know what you're logging on to. It's just like going to Starbucks. I can walk into Starbucks and put Starbucks and I can take out the C. Most people don't read it all. So I take out the C, next thing I know, you're logged on because you think that you're logging on to the real Starbucks. Because why? You just start reading the story and you're like, okay, this is Starbucks. So to answer your question, be vigilant. Can we all be hacked? Yes, that includes myself. Uh, I would like to ask you some questions. Sure. One question is, uh, uh, eight years ago, you know, my credit card was scammed in the U.S. Actually, mm -hmm. and then, so you know, probably you know, so, uh, someone you know, so fabricated you know, so, you know another card, and you know, say so, and he used he or she used you know, so that card and use uh, buy something mm -hmm. at the cost of Walmart, and then Walmart, uh, okay. um, uh, about uh, four hundred thousand here. But the money was returned. By the way, you know, at that time, 80 years ago, you know, the person had the technology to, you know, read the card. But the card, the data in the card is very, very simple, someone said. You know, just a number. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to fabricate. But, you know, uh, recently, you know, I had a similar problem, but uh, not real. However, I read uh, you know, bank explanation, and uh, he, uh, it said that you know, say once you know, say you know, that the criminal read you know, scam the card, mm. <coughs> maybe ping the data of the ping, mm -hmm. maybe stolen. Mm. Uh, is it right? Uh, fast? Uh, is it right? And uh, how, uh, how? And because uh, the ping data, maybe the data or ping ping data is installed in the card, so it's easy, right? Well, it, it depends on where you swiped your card a lot of times. So in the United States, for example, you go to get gas. You know, you don't have anybody out there pumping your gas or anything. You go in, you pop your card in. You don't see if there's a skimmer there. You pop your card in, and you put your PIN number in. A skimmer, what it does is it takes that information. The person who actually put the skimmer on comes back later that night and they take it off. Now they have your credit card and they have your PIN number. This is what they do. So whenever I go to any kind of machine, I always shake it. I always try to pull it out. And people are looking at me going, what are you trying to do? I'm like, I'm making sure I'm not being skimmed. So I always shake it because sometimes it'll pop right off. Poop and I've had it happen to me twice. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you have to be vigilant. Cash. <laughs> use cash, absolutely. Go to the bank and use cash. But in your case, it could, somebody could have had a skimmer. Sometimes what uh, somebody at the store may do is they may be working with a criminal enterprise. Mm -hmm. You swipe your card as they're leaving, they have another card over here. They swipe it also. They would do a double swipe. Mm -hmm. So now they got all your information here. That's why when I say, oh no, you're not taking my credit card, I'm gonna swipe it. That is one way you can prevent that. So when, they, when you go to a restaurant and you give them your card, how do you know what they're doing with your card? Yeah. What do you know? <laughs> they could, yeah, yeah. okay, here's your bill, yeah. but at the same time, you're in the back swiping. Hmm. So never give your credit card up to someone. Say, bring it here or let me go do it. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Just a general question. Sure. Facebook has a problem 
<laughs> yes. Do you think it's safe to keep using it? Do I think it's safe to keep using it? I have to ask a question. What do you think? And they have taken our information already. Mm -hmm. They hold it. Yes. So if we give up, I feel that they have taken away, then we stop using it. Mm -hmm. Then what's going to happen? Right now, Facebook is um, one of those companies that's under scrutiny, um, kind of like a lot of companies. If you look, like for example, I've been watching March Madness, and I'm not kidding. March Madness is where basketball games go on. Every commercial that has came on has dealt with privacy. Google, look at this, privacy. iPhone, privacy. I'm like, what? Okay. Almost every company is talking about privacy right now. So with Facebook, is it safe to use? I would say no, because it's just too much. They're giving out too much information. And they've already stated that, hey, um, yes, we were giving out your information to other vendors. And they did not let us know. They didn't let anyone know. So apologizing doesn't fix the problem. But it's up to you. I always say, read and educate yourselves. That is the best way. And if you think that it's OK for you, continue to use it. But if you don't think it's safe and you're concerned about your privacy, don't use it. Michael, I know you're rather limited on some of the things you can say. But what's your assessment of how Japan needs to better prepare for the upcoming Olympics? Are there any areas that they need to uh, kind of up their game or? Great you know? question, Eric Hall. So what do they need to do? They've already started with the infrastructure. I've looked at their self-defense page. I've looked at their um, communication page. I've looked at their cybersecurity. Their biggest thing is infrastructure, and they know it. At this point in time, I think that is the biggest thing they really, really, really need to be focused on. Now, you're going to centralize that into one location. I, am, I guarantee you that penetrators and hackers, hackivists around the world are going, this is going to be in one location? So what is the first thing that comes to my mind? Denial of service attacks. But I'm pretty sure with Japan that they're already prepared for it. I can't be 100% for sure, but I know that they have been working with different countries to ensure that this doesn't occur. So that is a great question. I mean, Japan is moving up from where they were to where they are now. I would say they have made great strides within the last five years, just incredible but they still have a long way to go, especially in the private sector. The private sector really scares me. The reason being is they don't take security very seriously. I know because I work with them because of what I do. And if it scares me, it should scare other people because now it's gonna take something major in order for them to change the laws. So I, I think that's one of the biggest things that, that, you know, even if it were me, what I would do, time someone touched down here, you're coming in for the Olympics, you're coming in two weeks before, I would start passing out flyers, I would start having commercials up there saying, if you break our laws, any kind of computer law, three years in prison, what does that do? Deter. Now you have to think, three years in prison in Japan? Wow, that's fish heads and rice. You have to, you have to deter. <laughs> and that's what I would do. And I've heard that mentioned before, like, we've got to deter. And I'm like, pass the law. So great question, Carl. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, just a follow-on question from that one. 
Um, is there anything in Japanese culture that actually inhibits their ability to deliver effective cybersecurity? I wanted to talk about this, but you got it. Yes, it is the, this is the way we've been doing it for so long. I've worked with them on certain systems and I've been told we've been doing this for the last 50 years. We don't need your help. I have to remind them, this is a US Navy asset. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what you've been doing. You would do what I tell you to do. In the private sector, you can't do that. You've got these guys that have been in for so long, and they're going, well, we're operating just fine. We're not going to change who we are. Why should I change? That means I got to spend more money. So when you say that, to me, it comes down to the Japanese culture. It's not against anyone in here. It's just the way that it is. If you think about it, you ride the trains, you see that you don't get off until the boss gets off and so forth, right? That's the way the Japanese culture is. So do you think overnight they're just going to be like, sure, go ahead and secure that? No. The Japanese sometimes are fixed in their ways. And I've had to fight them on this, even though it's my asset. <laughs> so what do you think they're doing in the corporate side? They're going, this is a way I'm making money, and I'm good. Michael, thank you very much for this very informative lecture.